Thank you, Adam, uh, for that kind introduction. And uh, thank you, everybody, for uh, joining this session uh, this afternoon. Um, it's my privilege and honor to be able to uh, talk to you and uh, share with you um, lots of ideas and thoughts about what I'm sure is a hot topic in everybody's mind at the moment, which is how to save energy, uh, particularly how to save uh, the costs uh, associated with uh, where energy prices uh, have now gone to, um, and also how to uh, look at moving towards being net zero carbon um, in light of not just the Church of England's target uh, to be net zero by 2030, uh, but an awful lot of other organisations uh, joining suit with similar um, uh, targets uh, within there. Um, I say I'll talk for about uh, 40 minutes or so, um, uh, just as we run through, and um, I have uh, time for questions at the end. It's a huge topic, um, so I'm going to have to, 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 to whiz through a number of areas uh, fairly quickly, but I hope to be able to give you uh, lots of insight and thoughts on uh, practical actions that you can do to save yourself energy now. Um, make sure my slides work. There we go. Um, so I'll go through a whole lot of quick wins. I will just touch on uh, bits around to do with decarbonisation and larger projects um, at the end, and then, then I'll say run through some questions. Obviously, this is a huge topic area at the moment because of the rising energy costs. Um, if we were talking about energy costs around about 18 months, two years ago, um, uh, we would have been looking at typical um, gas and electricity rates uh, for the small commercial market, which is really where, where churches and uh, uh, other sort of heritage properties uh, tend to, to, to buy their energy from, um, of about three pence a kilowatt hour for gas and about 10 pence a kilowatt hour for electricity, so three and 10. Um, what we've now seen um, is huge volatility in the energy market, which is obviously uh, very well covered in the media. Um, and the government has obviously now put in place a, um, a sort of supported energy cap, um, which uh, covers domestic uh, residential users. Um, but they also announced a couple of weeks ago um, uh, support for businesses as well, so business tariffs. That does cover churches and anybody that is procuring from a business tariff. So it's not just um, businesses, um, but it will cover um, uh, churches and, and, and other organisations, charities, etc. in there as well. Those capped energy prices it depends on a number of factors, but, but broadly speaking, that, that sort of supported energy price now is about 32 pence a kilowatt hour for electricity and about 10 pence a kilowatt hour for gas. That's a doubling in the previous electricity price and a tripling in the previous gas price. And that's your capped price. Um, so even with that cap in place, we're seeing a pretty much a doubling in electricity and a tripling in gas prices, obviously of huge concern and why I'm sure many of you uh, have joined uh, this session this afternoon. Uh, just as an aside, if that cap were not in place, the, uh, the sorts of um, rates we are currently seeing in the market can be going easily up as high as um, 50 pence uh, a, a kilowatt hour for electricity and 15 pence a kilowatt hour for gas. So the cap is doing something. It may not feel like it, um, but it is protecting uh, there. That's in place until um, uh, March next year, at which point it is being reviewed. We don't know what is going to happen um, from that period onwards. So uh, that's as a bit of an introduction. Uh, let's get into looking at what you can try and do to save yourself some money and some energy and some carbon all at the same time. The first place I'm going to start is actually not with saving energy, but this is to making sure that you're not paying too much money uh, on your energy bill. Um, uh, churches are charities. Um, they have charitable status and many other organisations um, in the heritage sector also operate as charities. As a charity, you should not be paying 20% VAT and you should not be playing climate change levy, uh, often abbreviated to CCL. Uh, no charities have to pay that regardless of how much they use. So first tip, go to your energy bill. You're going to have to get fairly familiar and, and start to love your energy bills, um, or at least love looking at them. Um, so the, the, the first tip is to look at them and make sure that you are not being charged 20% VAT. You should only be charged 5% percent VAT um, in there because of your charitable status. Um, if you are being charged 20% VAT, the 
likelihood is almost certainty is you'll be being charged this climate change levy, this CCL as well. So you may be thinking, oh, look, it's okay, I'm a charity, um, but actually because of all my VAT arrangements, I claim back my VAT, so I'm not too worried about that. Um, that may be the case, um, but you won't be able to claim back your climate change levy um, item. So it's, it's important, even if you do claim back your VAT, um, that you, uh, you make sure you're being charged the right amount and they know your energy supplier knows um, that you are a charity and you have that VAT status there. So if you do go along and find on your bills that you are being incorrectly charged, the wrong rate of VAT, what you have to do is go into any internet search engine, type in your supplier's name, let's say you're getting from British Gas, British Gas VAT declaration, up will pop a link to a form, it's normally only one page, uh, you need to fill in and you that is the form you need to send to them to tell them that you are indeed a charity and they should only be uh, charging you 5% VAT and they should never charge you CCL. Um, if they've been charging you that for a period of time that you can claim back um, any excess charges for up to six years but that only tends to apply where you've remained with your same supplier over that period of time. So you can normally go back as far as you've been with that supplier. Um, trying to gain it back from suppliers you've you're no longer in contract with gets a little bit tricky. Technically, you should be able to do it, but uh, um, it's very, very difficult um, to do because obviously you're not in contract with them uh, anymore. Um, so that's in there. Now, often if you start looking at your, particularly your gas bills in the summer, then you'll think, oh yeah, this is all fine, 5% VAT, yeah, that's great. Um, that's because there's another reason why you may not be charged um, uh, full rate VAT, and that's because you only consume a, a relatively low amount, which is, is what's deemed to be a domestic amount. So I would always suggest you have a look at your highest uh, gas bill uh, sometime in the middle of the winter, normally uh, December, January time, um, and check that that one uh, isn't being charged, because sometimes you just find you go over that, uh, that low level of usage uh, category, and that trips you into being charged. So that's the first tip. Go in there, save yourself some money if you are being charged the wrong thing. Um, the next point, uh, we've done a, I've done hundreds and hundreds of, of church energy audits. Um, now churches are um, uh, uh, quite interesting. In They tend to use most of their electricity um, in evenings and in weekends. And um, uh, that is when you can get evening and weekend tariffs, which are cheaper. And uh, that will mean that you have a meter uh, that uh, swaps over um, from recording whether you're uh, in peak time, so during the daytime, um, or whether you're consuming at the evening and weekends. Um, some of the, the, all the newer meters will do this automatically, they'll automatically update their time, that's all good. Um, but a lot of the churches still have the very old mechanical type of meters. Um, two, two dials on here. Uh, let me just turn on my uh, uh, spotlight, if that works. Uh, yeah, two dials here, one recording evenings and weekends, and this mechanical timer next to it, which switch over between one and the other. I would say about 80% of these time clocks are wrong. Um, because of various power cuts and uh, bits and pieces uh, that have gone on over the years, uh, they can often have the wrong time on them. Sometimes they can even have the wrong day on them. So that when you are in the church, particularly on a Sunday, using uh, your electricity, thinking you're getting a cheaper rate, actually the meter sinks. it's eight o'clock on a Monday morning and it's charging you the full rate. So if you do have one of these meters, go along, make sure the time is set correctly. Um, and if it's not, uh, you can't do anything about that. You will need to phone up your um, energy supplier and say, my meter is wrong. Uh, please come out and fix it. And they have a duty to do so, and they have a duty to do so without charging you. Um, so do check that if you are on an evening and weekend tariff. If you're not on an evening and weekend tariff, it's worth thinking about if you do predominantly use your building only at evenings and weekends. Then we are going to start getting in to look at uh, how to save some energy and some quick tips. I very much focus today's sessions on quick things that you can go away and you can do now. So uh, the first thing is actually to have a look at your boiler controls. Um, uh, boilers will tend to have a little thermostat um, dial on them, uh, actually on the front of the boiler. Um, and this sets the uh, temperature at which the um, water comes out of that boiler. Um, some boilers um, will have two thermostats on them, um, uh, one with a little flame on it and one with a big flame on it. Um, and this is a dual uh, burner, uh, so it's got a high and low flame setting on that boiler. Um, and a lot of people think that the high flame setting should be set to the highest level and the low flame setting should be set to the lowest level. 
Nope, that's wrong. It needs to be the other way around. What the high flame setting does is gives this massive boost. It's like putting your car in something like third gear. Um, lots of energy being consumed to get you up to, um, uh, to temperature. And what the low flame setting does is once you've got there, like putting your car in fifth gear or sixth gear, depending on how posh your car is, um, and, and just lets it coast at a lower level. So you want the temperature setting on your high flame one to be a little bit lower than the temperature setting on your low flame at one. So it's kind of the opposite way around to a lot of people think. A lot of boilers only have one temperature setting, um, like you can see here, um, and a number of people have set that up to max. Um, that's not really the best place you want to be. You want to be about two thirds of the way around the dial, depends how your dial is set up. Um, this one, as we can see here, is set to one to six. So ideally, if you're setting it somewhere around about four, that's normally um, where boilers are manufactured and designed uh, to work at their optimum level in that. Um, so um, uh, you, can, you can start to sort of make sure that you're not going too much. Um, if you're turning it right up to max, that boiler's generally working an awful lot harder to produce very, very hot water, perhaps 85, 90 degrees into your heating system, which your heating system will just have it won't really be able to cope with it, it'll be too much. Most radiators are set to work at around about 70 degrees. Um, so it will just be unnecessarily getting your boiler to work particularly hard. Um, another uh, thing to look at whilst you're down in your boiler room is the frost setting. Um, often there is a frost thermostat. Um, looks something like this. You can always tell a frost thermostat because it, it, it has a zero and, and a minus number on it. So, um, and it doesn't go up that high. So you can quickly work out that actually that's, that's the frost thermostat uh, rather than your normal room thermostat, um, which will typically start at 10 and go up to about 30. Um, this is the thermostat at which um, when you get to below whatever temperature is set on, on this, this thermostat, your boiler system will fire, regardless of whether your time clock is telling it to fire or not. Um, if it falls below this frost fat level, your boiler will come on, it will start burning lots of gas because it's worried that your pipes are going to freeze. However, if you've set your frost stat at something like five or 10 degrees, you'll find your boiler is just coming on an awful lot of time when it doesn't need to be. Um, uh, water, um, as everybody will know, has the freezing point of, of, of zero. Um, uh, actually, there'll be chemicals, or there should be chemicals, within the um, water within heating systems, which would actually mean the freezing point's even lower again. Um, but you really want to be making sure your frost stat, um, depending on where it is, is probably set to something like two or three degrees. Something like that is quite appropriate. Uh, so it's just tripping in before you get to zero. Just do have a, a quick thought about where your frost stat is located and um, where, how exposed your pipes are, etc., and, and, and set accordingly. Um, but do make sure that's not set too high. We can see in churches about 30% of um, gas and oil consumption, depending on whether you're on gas or oil, um, being used uh, just because the boiler is firing away in the middle of the night um, to protect itself from frost because frost settings are set slightly too high. Um, so it is an, an important area. There are other things you can do. You can you put um, different chemicals into the uh, system. We've actually got an antifreeze property that would allow you to go lower. Um, but you're going to need to speak to your um, boiler um, maintenance people um, about whether they can fill your system with one of those. Now, hot topic for uh, churches and other heritage buildings um, is background heating. Um, and I could talk for uh, a very long time on background heating. Um, don't worry, I'm not going to. I'm going to try and cover this fairly quickly. Um, and uh, should you be heating your church all the time? Um, is that the best thing to do for the fabric? Um, we've got a lot of churches um, that I go and see that will turn around and say, oh, I just turn the heating on for a couple of hours in the morning just to take the damp off. Um, uh, it's probably actually that, that behaviour um, and, and a way of setting the heating system is possibly about the worst thing you could do. Um, so um, I'll just explain um, why that is the case. So a lot of churches we, we know are only used um, for these ad hoc periods of time here and there, um, obviously, uh, particularly um, for Sunday worship, but perhaps uh, midweek activities as well, and it's not used during the rest of the time. Um, generally, um, uh, most churches, and by no means all, but most churches um, were built at a time when um, heating systems, or central heating particularly, um, was not commonplace, um, and the fabric of them actually doesn't normally require temperature to um, uh, uh, go in there to keep the buildings um, uh, nice and maintained. They're quite happy not being heated. 
In fact, in most regards, they're, they're better not being heated at all because what they really want is stability. They don't, the, the fabrics of historic buildings don't like rapid change, um, particularly in humidity, um, but also in temperature. Um, so if you can keep it stable, that's the best thing. Um, two ways of keeping it stable. One, don't heat it at all. The other is heat it 24 hours a day. Um, and anything in the middle um, is less than ideal. Um, but obviously we do have uh, ourselves and other people going into these buildings and we want it to be comfortable for them. So we do need to heat it. We're heating it more for the people than we are for the building, um, which um, is why if we're, we're setting that temperature around um, and, and, and timing around when we're using it, that's fine. But try to get out of this habit of, of flicking it on for a couple of hours a day, um, because what you're doing is you are raising that temperature up. So you're creating instability and then it's dropping back down again. Um, that will be, give rapid temperature changes and rapid humidity changes um, in there, which is really not going to be enjoyed uh, by the fabric of that building at all. So I can speak a lot more on that one. Um, if you have been constantly heating your church and you're looking to, um, to, to stop that, um, perhaps do just speak with uh, perhaps a church architect or other advisor, um, because if your building's got used to something and you're changing it to something else, it is something you need to consider carefully. Um, and if for whatever reasons you have been constantly background heating your church, i.e. 24 hours a day, at a background level, um, and it may be because of issues, you've got medieval wall paintings, um, or you've got some very precious artifacts um, in there, particularly if you've got some museum type of buildings, um, you may have to do that, which is fine, um, but it's quite possible that that background heating level can be reduced. And normally for historic buildings, the background heating level are, is around about 10 or 12 degrees. That's about normally the best place for that to be if you've got um, particularly special um, requirements, as I say, um, wall paintings is, is, is one that we do see um, quite often. Um, so we're not background heating to 16 or even 14. It, it's lower than that. 10 or 12 is normally around about the best place. Um, for that to be. So it's a big issue um, and we can see um, energy consumptions in churches that have got what we would describe as ill-thought-out background heating being two, three, four times more than churches that haven't. So it's a massive, massive issue and if you are in that category then, um, then do, um, do very seriously consider that because that could easily save you all of the uh, cost of um, uh, the energy increases that we're seeing coming through. Um, other things to have a quick look at in terms of um, savings um, are timers um, and bits and pieces um, that tend to have or should have timers um, are electric hot water heaters um, and also external floodlighting. Um, we'll deal with hot water heaters first. These are often little units that sit underneath the sink, um, often storing five or ten litres of hot water in them and constantly making sure that that, that that hot water is kept up to temperature and you want it to be up to temperature when the building is being used, um, but perhaps you don't need it to be kept up to temperature overnight. Um, so therefore it's very sensible to install a time clock um, and this is a, um, a, a, a little electrical time clock switch um, that is designed to be a straight replacement for the um, electrical connection where these um, units tend to be wired in, technically called an electrical fuse spur. Um, this is, is a direct replacement from those so an electrician can very easily install this in a matter of minutes for you. Um, and that then allows you to set times and days when you want your hot water heater to come on and when you're quite happy for it not to be on. Um, so maybe you turn it off uh, every night and therefore it's not constantly heating overnight. So that can be a useful thing to do. Then we come in to external floodlighting. Um, now, if I was delivering this presentation a year ago, I would have been talking an awful lot about timings of floodlights and I'll still do a little bit of that but actually uh, where we are now I'm going to be uh, posing the challenging questions of should you even be having external floodlighting on your building if it is for let's say decorative and architectural purposes is it appropriate in the middle of uh, an energy crisis a climate crisis and, and energy cost uh, uh, issues um, to be uh, spending lots of money uh, throwing light up in your building so it looks pretty to everybody that drives past it. Perhaps that's an area we can consider um, uh, stopping uh, doing uh, if, if that's um, not too much of a challenge um, in there, but I will be a little bit provocative and suggest that as the first piece. Um, if you've got external floodlighting and you really desperately do want to keep it on, um, and, and I can understand the reasons why, there are various bits and pieces that you can consider on this. It really should not be staying on till after 11 o'clock at night, 
um, uh, external flood lighting left on uh, after 11 p.m. is generally considered to be light pollution. Um, so if you're going on after that, congratulations, you are a light polluter. Um, and really do have a look to see whether you can change that timing to get it off um, before then. Interesting, I've done a few bits of community consultations um, with communities that have had um, uh, churches in particular that have had external flood lighting asking the community what time they think it ought to go off. Um, and often the response is back going, oh, it's nice to see it when we're driving home from work, et cetera, et cetera, or walking uh, around the village, perhaps on a dog walk or whatever else um, of an evening. But anything after 10 o'clock, it can absolutely go off. Um, so uh, maybe consider sort of knocking that timing back. Um, I've got lots of other churches that use their flood lighting um, uh, quite carefully around um, uh, the sort of the church calendar and their mission and those kind of bits and pieces. So other things to give some thought to is almost doing the opposite with um, your floodlighting as you do with the flowers. Um, so perhaps having your floodlighting only on um, uh, during Lent and during Advent. So you are highlighting the church in uh, the, the, the lead up to those um, important festivals of the year. Um, uh, other churches I know, uh, just throwing a few more out, um, ideas out there, um, get people to sponsor uh, their floodlighting uh, to be on of an evening. So they pay uh, a couple of pounds um, and the floodlighting is, is set to be on for them. Um, and perhaps they do that in memory of somebody or to celebrate an anniversary um, of their marriage in that church or something along those lines. Uh, so they can they can drive past that, that, that church that night and go, oh, yes, the lights are on because that's for me to, in, in celebration. Um, of, of whatever event um, it is. That takes quite a bit of administration, but it does bring a little bit of money in as well. So there are a few ideas around floodlighting in there. Um, uh, then think about how you are using your building um, and the times that you've got various things going on. And I know a lot of communities are now looking at their churches and uh, particularly church halls as being um, heat banks, uh, so places of, of, of warm refuge that communities uh, can go to if they cannot afford to heat their own houses, um, which is brilliant uh, and fantastic. Um, I would question uh, in a number of places whether the church building itself is the most appropriate building to do that. Maybe the church can do it, um, that's the church as a community rather than the church building, um, because often churches are the hardest buildings in the community to heat, um, often with the lowest uh, insulation levels and uh, a large amount of cold drafts blowing through them. So perhaps if you are thinking about that um, and you have perhaps a church school or something along those lines that's already been heated during the day and you can do something in the evening um, there, that may be a more appropriate place to think about. You can still be the church doing it, but it doesn't need to be actually in, uh, particularly if you've got a medieval drafty voluminous church um, that's incredibly difficult to heat, may not be the most prudent place to do it, um, but I also understand there are other drivers around why that may want to be the place. Um, but if you are looking at doing that or you've got other lettings going on um, and other usage in the buildings, it makes sense to, to, to actually try and combine a number of those usage together. Um, what we've got here is a typical heating profile um, for a building. So as soon as your boilers come on, you've got an awful lot of gas consumption to get them started, get the whole system up to temperature, start to bring the building up to temperature, and then that rapidly falls away and uh, drops actually uh, throughout the day um, as the building's um, up to 10 and it's just ticking over. Um, what you get then, if you have two events during the day, um, these are actually two different buildings, so you'll notice the scales are slightly different, so they're not directly comparable, but it, it's the profile I'm trying to show. Um, so if you get two events, you get that peak basically twice during the day. If you could actually combine those two events together, all that would have happened is that would have carried on for a little bit longer at a much, much lower level and you would have avoided this peak here. So if you can back together or bookend various um, uh, uh, usage of the buildings all together, so you're going straight from one into another and you're keeping the heating running um, uh, for that combined period and you're avoiding this double peak, uh, that can be a very, very useful way of um, uh, being able to save um, some costs out there um and, and, and keep that building uh, warm as well which is why i end up coming to the conclusion that perhaps schools are a really good place to do um let's say uh, warm or heat banks uh, warm hubs uh, the other name for them um, because it's been heated during the day uh, and, and perhaps running that on for several hours in the evening um uh, to provide people with warm sanctuary of an evening is a really good place because they would have already gone through this peak and it's just about uh, a matter of extending that that area for longer 
a few other bits and pieces um, in there on heating. Um, in there is actually doing a little bit of a cleaning, uh, a little bit of dusting uh, can really help to um, improve the efficiency um, of, uh, of, of heating systems. Um, so uh, if you uh, obviously got thermal images going on here, um, and probably most people will be familiar with thermal images, so that so the, the lighter, whiter, yellower colours are hotter and the darker colours are colder um, in there. Um, but you don't need a thermal image to do this, you can do it with your hand in most cases. So if you look at this radiator here, it's hot at the bottom, it's gold at the top. That means there is air in the system and that radiator really isn't doing uh, you very much good. Um, and you need to get your little radiator bleed key out and bleed the air out of it. All your heating systems will probably have uh, recently um, have come on or will be coming on in the next few weeks as the weather gets colder. And that's an excellent time to go around, put your hand on the radiator, start off at the top and move down towards the bottom. And if you find it's gold at the top and hot at the bottom, get your air bleed key out and bleed the air out so your system is working more efficiently. If you find it's the other way around, as we can see in this radiator here, um, where it's hot at the top, and actually as you run down, it's gold at the bottom, um, or, um, and you can often find that's in the middle of the radiator. It depends where the pipes go in and out of the radiator. Um, but yeah, it's cold at the bottom, hot at the top. That's because you've got sludge buildup uh, inside your radiator. Um, and you will then need to get your plumber or heating engineer out to flush your system and clean that sludge out. Um, if you're really worried about underground pipes uh, bursting, if you start to flush your system, you can just flush radiators. Uh, you just need to disconnect the valves going into them and you can flush the radiator um, through as an individual item without having to worry about um, potentially causing leaks in uh, underground pipework. There are different ways you can do flushing, which is less likely to cause leaks as well. If you have fan convector heaters, um, and you would have normally seen these uh, when they've got a grill on the front of them, so they have a, a grill at the top and a grill at the bottom, uh, and this is the bit that does the heating, um, and there's a fan unit sitting in behind here. You can see this one has got a, a nice material fluffy um, a filter on it, which stops all the dust getting into the uh, fan motor and clogging that up, which is good. Um, but that does mean that you get dust build up on this filter. So if you've not taken that cover off and got a nice hoover out and cleaned that filter out and any debris on top of this heating grill out uh, about every year, um, that whole heater will perform less efficiently. Um, so really, as part of your spring clean or, or ideally your autumn clean, um, you ought to be taking that cover off gently, uh, hoovering out, um, all the dust from here. Um, and, and I say gently because you can very easily damage um, these very fine fins um, here. So often uh, with a, a hoover with, with one of those little brush um, uh, adapters on, 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 on the front of it is the best thing to use um, and hoover all that dust off, you'll find that that heating system works much better. Um, I've now noticed that for some reason, uh, PowerPoint has done its lovely thing of turning a photograph around in the middle of the slides, Never mind. Um, you can all look sideways if you want to, but you can just look at the two photographs on the right um, for the points. But actually, we find an awful lot of boiler rooms are the warmest place within the building, and they shouldn't be. Um, all that is, is wasted heat. You want the heat to go into your building, not just stick into your boiler room. The reason that boiler rooms are often the warmest place in the building is because their pipework um, is not flagged. You can see all this exposed pipework here. And that's all acting as one massive radiator, um, which means all that lovely heat that's being produced by your boiler, the first thing that happens is it warms up your boiler room um, and less heat gets into the body of the building, church, whatever it might be. Um, so um, a really good tip is to go around and lag every last little bit of pipe work that you can see uh, in your boiler room, including around um, pumps and you can get different flexible jackets and all sorts of things um, that are designed to go in around all sorts of complicated fittings. Um, so not just the straight pipes, all the other bits and pieces as well, and keep the heat in the system so it gets into your building rather than warms up your boiler room. It can be a really effective thing to do. Drafts really are the enemy of comfort. And what we really want to be achieving in buildings is a comfortable environment. I'm less concerned what number on the thermostat is uh, and more concerned about how comfortable people are and drafts um, even in warm buildings can make them incredibly uncomfortable um, as we've probably all experienced there's very little that's more unpleasant than a cold draft running down the back of your neck um, so the more we can prevent drafts and more we can actually um, 
uh, slow down air movement within buildings uh, the better. Um, we do need some air movement for ventilation um, booked. Uh, there's a difference between drafts and ventilation. Uh, ventilation tends to be controlled, drafts are uncontrolled. Um, so a little bit of controlled and thoughtful ventilation can be useful. Big drafts blowing a gale where you don't want them and when you don't want them are definitely not useful and are to be avoided. So a few quick tips about trying to prevent some drafts around your building um, in there um, are looking at the doors and uh, here's a thumbnail image of a door in a church and uh, you'll notice the dark colours are and they always tend to be at the doors at the bottom of the door that's where the cold drafts are coming into the building you can start to see this um, we call it cold staining uh, on a thermal image um, coming in across the floor um, and therefore a very useful um, uh, uh, thing is is what's often called a sausage dog um, tucked in at the bottom of the door I believe you can make them yourself with um, old tights and carrier bags if you want to or you can buy them online um, or many uh, hardware stores and tuck that in at the bottom of the door, particularly if that door is not one that's um, uh, that, that's used a lot. Um, if it is a fire escape door and opens outwards, just um, clip the that, that to the door, and then the sausage dog will will open with the door in the case of emergency and won't cause a trip hazard um, in there. Um, obviously, if your main door is going to be open, so you'll want to avoid it for that. Um, keyholes, interestingly, um, after we can get inherited buildings and very large keyholes, which is just open to the outside, and a draft can blow through those. Um, fridge magnets, because uh, normally the, the, the keyholes are metal, um, can be very useful at uh, just to get a fridge magnet um, of a place you visited and perhaps no one longer like uh, off your fridge. And uh, if you want to, you can paint it black or whatever colour the, uh, the metal of the, um, uh, the, the around the, um, the keyhole is and uh, attach that over and that stops that draft blowing through. If you want to go online, you can even buy some magnets that look like keyholes for you. Um, but I'll leave that up to you about the appearance you want to do on that one. Um, uh, another photograph that uh, PowerPoint has nicely twisted around for me um, is uh, these hopper windows, uh, quite commonly seen in uh, stained and historic glass uh, settings. Um, and typically uh, these opening bits never quite shut properly. There's always a draft around them. Um, so uh, a, a method of, of managing to seal up that draft in a way that uh, is actually approved by most heritage organisations um, and works really nicely um, is actually to go down to the uh, local craft store and buy some black plasticine or whatever colour your window happens to be and put the plasticine in around the gap um, that's created and that can nicely seal up um, that draft in there. The advantage of plasticine is you can open a window and it peels away and you've caused no damage to the paintwork or, or anything else. It's a very, very effective way of sealing drafts around windows. You can use it at home as well. So, um, other bits and pieces uh, that you can do, there are some light bulbs that are very, very easy to change um, and you can do it as a DIY version. There are other light fittings um, which are slightly harder to change but still worthwhile doing. Um, where you're probably going to need an electrician in to change the fittings. So the ones we typically see in churches, which you can do yourselves literally by changing your light bulbs rather than changing the entire fittings, um, are the ones I've marked in here with the big tick at the bottom of it. Um, so a, what's known as a PAR 38 um, reflector lamp. Um, so it looks like a, a sort of about a, a tea saucer size at the front um, in there, uh, it screws in. Um, if that's not an LED, it'll be 120 watts. If it is an LED, it's only going to be 15 watts, something like that, 15, 20 watts. Uh, so massive energy savings, literally screw one out, screw one in. Um, the little down lighters, we probably mainly see those in our uh, kitchens and bathrooms at home. Um, there are two types. The ones that have got two lugs at the bottom, you can, they're mains voltage, you can very, very easily just swap one lamp for the other. Um, the version that's got two twins, uh, two pins at the bottom uh, is low voltage, normally runs on 12 volts. Um, and that's slightly more difficult to change like for like for uh, just take one bulb out and stick an LED version in, um, because what you need to do is make sure that the transformer that sits behind that, that changes it from high voltage to low voltage, um, uh, is sized correctly for the new LED lights that are going in there. So you may need an electrician to help you with that one. So just be aware of the two different types. Obviously, normal, what we'd see is classic light bulbs, GLS light bulbs, um, with um, uh, often with different fittings on the bottom. Some of them will be a bayonet cap, that one's a screw uh, fitting in there. Um, you, can, you can very easily change, literally, yeah, changing a light bulb. Um, simple as that. So any of those, get out there and do yourself. Um, any other fittings, you are likely to require an electrician to actually change the entire fitting. 
um, or advise you differently on. Um, also to give some thought about um, water um, savings. Um, it can be very useful to save water as well um, out there. Um, so let's just not think about energy, let's think a little bit wider. You can often get free um, uh, items for water savings, and we are still in a drought uh, situation in most parts of the country. Um, so free water saving um, items are available normally from your local water company. So you can put these flush bags into uh, toilet systems. You can change uh, the heads on taps um, to make sure that they, they um, flow at an appropriate level for washing your hands and you don't get blasted with a whole stream of water that then splashes all over your trousers, um, as we probably all experienced. So um, they are quite helpful in there as well. Um, a little word about um, uh, changing energy prices and heat pumps. Um, it's something that comes up quite a lot. Um, and obviously, uh, I thought I'd just, just touch on that, uh, on sort of bigger issues for the last few moments um, before we dive into questions um there um so if we look at where i mentioned historic energy prices were that's sort of 15 and 3 in there for electricity and gas um oil um would would cost more than gas um so oil used to be about 60 ish pence 50 60 pence uh, a, a, a liter which translates to around about five or six pence a kilowatt hour um in there so it's typically about double the gas uh, price or it used to be um uh then you can see that on the historic prices, three pence uh, for gas, 15 pence for electricity, the ratio between those is one to five. Um, and this ratio becomes important in a moment. Um, the capped price, uh, you can see, as I mentioned, about 32 for electricity, 10 for gas. The ratio there has reduced down quite considerably um, and is, is about oh, just, uh, uh, sort of a 3.2 ratio. And the uncapped prices, I say that's currently where the market is, it's actually slightly over that um, at the moment, um, uh, and, and, and massive volatility in that, but you can see the ratio there has gone down to a one in three ratio. Why is that really important to understand this ratio when we're looking at heat pumps? And um, what heat pumps do, and I won't go into a whole lecture on heat pumps now, um, but what they essentially do is they take a unit of electricity, they put it through a heat pump and put out more units of heat than the number of units of electricity you put in. Um, and how good a heat pump is at taking a unit of electricity and producing more units of heat is known as the coefficient of performance. And there are lots of different varieties and flavours of heat pumps out there. One of my pet hates is the media talking about heat pumps as one entity. That's a little bit like talking about transport as one entity. Um, and as we all know, you can get from A to B by walking, by taking your getting on your bike, by driving a car, by getting into a plane, they all got very different pros and cons to them and you'd all use them in different ways. The same is true for heat pumps. Um, so different types of heat pumps have different performance levels um, and the coefficient of performance is a measure of how many units of heat it produces for one unit of electricity you put in. Um, the best type of heat pumps are generally running about four, maybe up to five uh, units of heat for every unit of electricity you put in. So historically, if you had the best possible type of heat pump, it would still probably cost you more to have gone to a heat pump than it would have been if you're on mains gas. Different if you're on oil, because oil is more expensive. Um, so changing oil to, to heat pumps was, well, was a worthwhile thing to do. Changing from mains gas to heat pumps, oof, you didn't really see that much, if any, um, energy saving. That's why some of the media say these things cost more money to run. However, where we've now got to, uh, at this ratio of around about three, is that all the heat pumps, except the high temperature air to water heat pumps, have all become much more efficient to run um, in cost terms uh, than a, a, a mains gas boiler is. So what's happened in the energy market over the last 12 months is that suddenly heat pumps are actually becoming a cost saving area as well as a carbon saving area. Um, so it's an important thing to do. A lot of media, mainstream media, haven't actually caught up with that yet, um, but that is what's happening out there. When looking at decarbonising and thinking about the uh, wider agenda um, out there, there are loads and loads of things you can do. Um, and I just thought I'd highlight um, in, in kind of two areas um, there. You can do lots of decarbonisation measures that are going to save you money. Um, typically, the best things to do um, are to look at your energy lighting and put PV panels up. They are going to save you money in the quickest possible time and insulate those pipe works and those boiler rooms we talked about earlier. Um, other bits and pieces, some easy insulation measures, um, so cavity and loft insulation and moving to um, electric point of use uh, hot water rather than stored hot water in big tanks 
um, can also save you money. Um, you see, those were the historic paybacks. Um, so that's where we were with the prices uh, we were looking at uh, 18 months, two years ago. This is the payback for those same things now, given where the new rates are. So you can see we've bought more, um, more of those energy saving measures that become much better in terms of their financial performance in there, giving really rapid paybacks. So those are the sorts of things you can be doing. I say quick and easy installation, LED and PV are going to save you the money in the quickest possible way. Um, however, if you're really looking at deep carbon savings, you need to be considering some other things as well. But these are going to be saving you carbon, less so on saving you money. So heat pumps, even though, as I said in the earlier slide, they are now actually saving you money. Um, whereas we were going, well, actually, heat pumps, the payback period is going to be 100 years, if at all, um, in there, which really isn't a payback at all. Um, we've now seen that improve, but still, it's not really a massive money saving item. Um, and, and, and Windows uh, example as well. Um, you know, if you're looking at window replacements in certain buildings and certainly in churches, you're not uh, going to be allowed to do that in, in a number of cases. Um, uh, you can see that actually, yes, they, they're an enormous carbon saving item um, because of the, the cost of doing them and, and the small amount of energy that they save. They're not necessarily a cost saving item. So strategies for linking your decarbonisation um, uh, ambitions with saving money in today's current environment is to focus on all of these quick wins, these energy saving items now. Uh, and perhaps think about uh, the heat pumps and, 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 and other more expensive items uh, later down the line as we come through. Um, I want to leave some time for questions, so I will leave it there. Um, I'm expecting um, my uh, one of the questions to be, uh, this all sounds great, but where I can get some money for this. So I have just put a web link at the bottom there, um, for which is a link to the um, uh, Church of England resource, but it's not uh, just the CHIP CV. Um, or listing all of the funding that is uh, sources that are available for churches, and they have a specific section in that for environmental and energy saving items. So if you are looking at having a scheme and you need some money, um, that is a first resource to go and have a look at because that question always comes up. Um, but I will uh, look forward to uh, questions coming through. Uh, I think Adam, you're going to uh, uh, have a quick look through some of those and um, put them through. Absolutely. Um... Thanks, Matt. Thanks um, so much for that. It's been a really useful and interesting uh, session. We've had a few questions coming in, um, as you might have expected. One of the ones that several people asked um, was that they're, they're not connected to a gas supply, uh, presumably rural churches. Uh, can you give any advice about oil boilers? Yeah, so the, the, the advice is actually very similar. Um, so gas boilers and oil boilers, whilst they have different fuel going into them, um, the quick win measures I went through um, are still equally as valid in terms of making sure the frost setting's right and the boiling thermostats are right and insulating around them. That's absolutely true for whatever type of fuel you are using in your boiler. Um, uh, oil, as those churches that are on it will be uh, well aware, um, uh, is a, uh, a higher cost fuel um, than uh, the mains gas. Um, that's still uh, so, but we haven't seen um, the same level of price rises uh, for the oil market um, as we have in the mains gas market. So as I mentioned mains gas has gone up really about threefold. Um, oil um, has probably doubled in line with um, the electricity price. So, um, and if you are able to buy your oil in summer, um, the prices tend to be lower in summer um, as most people that buy oil are aware um, on that. Um, but because the costs are higher, um, it does mean that, 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 that uh, the benefit of doing energy saving measures, again, you're going to get more, um, more saving uh, for the same measure as you would in a gas boiler. Um, also, if churches are on oil, they tend to be, and I'm going to make some kind of generic uh, assumptions here, they tend to be your more rural churches. They tend to be used um, uh, uh, less often, um, uh, so perhaps only for you know a Sunday service, or maybe even only a couple of services a month in a lot of rural churches, um, and therefore taking them off oil and using direct electric heating is often a very sensible thing for them to do. Um, but I could talk about that for a long period of time. I'm not going to. Thanks, Matt. Before I go into the next question, I I'm going to um, do some technology, and I'm going to launch a poll. Um, for people to fill in, which will flash upon your screen with some multiple choice questions about how helpful you found uh, today. So I'll launch that, and then I'll then I'll go into the uh, into the next question. <clears throat> 
Um, Matt, there's been a question um, from somebody who's having some uh, renovation done on their church hall and asking whether you'd recommend uh, solar panels and uh, smart meters. Um, so solar panels, absolutely. Um, if it is appropriate for um, the heritage context um, of that building, um, solar panels are incredibly useful. Uh, but the main thing you want to be making sure with solar panels is really you are going to be using the majority of the electricity they generate on your building. Um, so uh, pleased to hear it's a hall because um, halls tend to get used the most um, out there. And if you're using that hall during the day, for example, when I know a lot of the church halls have um, uh, preschools or whatever um, in them. So you've got someone in there using your electricity during the day whilst the solar panels are generating it. That works really well. Where it becomes less viable is um, if you're looking at, let's say, a church and it's really only used for Sunday worship and a bit of choir practice and maybe some bell ringing and maybe a Wednesday morning service, but really not very often during those daylight hours. You can be having solar panels, they're generating lots of energy, but the energy is going straight into the grid, so you're not really getting any advantage over that. Um, and then there's a huge question about whether it's most appropriate to put your panels on the church or another building, um, which would be using um, uh, would be using that energy. So yes, it's a great, great idea, um, so long as you're using the energy in your building. Um, when that, that that energy is going to be generated by the solar panels, which is obviously going to be during uh, daylight hours in there. Um, smart meters are great. They don't actually save you any energy, but they do inform you where your energy is going. Uh, they only save you energy if you act on the data that they produce for you. Um, all um, energy suppliers have now got smart meter rollouts. So if you haven't got one, um, you can normally phone them up and ask for one and they will come out and install one for no cost for you. Thanks, Matt. We've had a few questions come in about pew, he pew heaters. Mm -hmm. uh, pew heaters, uh, so um, uh, pew heaters are great. Um, uh, if you have fixed pews, they are a brilliant and effective way at heating your church if you're only using your church for um, kind of uh, sporadic intermediate times um, during the week. So uh, I often talk about a Sunday used church that I've done a, a few times. Um, so if you're just using that for I don't know, two or three times in the week for an hour or two, um, they are really very, very useful, probably one of the most effective ways of providing thermal comfort into a church. Um, if you've been used to the old tube uh, heaters, the sort of 40 watt or 60 watt foot tube heaters, um, more commonly seen in greenhouses, um, but think again, uh, they've moved on an awful lot. We've now got uh, panel heaters properly designed to go in underneath pews um, that mm -hmm. are very highly effective. Um, actually uh, installed those on my local parish church um, and, and transformational in terms of the thermal comfort that they provide. Um, and they're also very efficient. They really only need to be turned on about 15, 20 minutes before a service. Um, and they, they make people feel comfortable um, because of the hot air that rises past you as you're sat on the pew. Um, the warm air comes from up underneath the pew and rises past you. So it warms up your, uh, particularly your lower limbs. Um, which is the most comfortable form of heating. You, everybody wants a cooler head and, and, and warmer feet um, and provides comfort in that way rather than attempting to try and warm the entirety of the air volume in the church. So yeah, they are really very good. Um, there is a case study on um, uh, the church I mentioned and my local parish one. You can watch another video of me if you've really uh, not fed up with me yet uh, on the Church of England um, uh, environmental case study website. Um, there is um, a case study of that there, so you can have a good look and see lots of images of them. Thanks for that, Matt. Um, you um, you mentioned about hot water heaters uh, and timer controls on those. Somebody's asked whether there's a potential for any Legionella problems as a result of that. Yep, um, very good question. Um, the So I'm talking about that mainly on the, um, the very small... Um, uh, uh, sort of <clears throat> under sink electric point of use water heaters. Uh, they tend to store only five or 10 litres um, of hot water in there. They are deemed by HSE if you want to read uh, their code of practice on Legionella, um, which I have done, but I understand most people won't want to, um, uh, as the lowest risk um, uh, hot water generation in there. So they only need to run at 50 degrees rather than the 60 degrees that normal large hot water tanks would need to run at for Legionella protection. Um, and ideally, if you if you want to be very um, careful about Legionella, they need to be on for one hour every day. So they've gone up to temperature, they've um, they've heated up, which is what's known as pasteurisation um, of that hot water, killed any bugs in it, 
um, and then you can let them cool down again. So if you do want to be very careful about Legionella, um, then put your timer on for one hour every day uh, on that, but they can certainly be turned off overnight. Thanks for that, Matt. Just going back to your um, answer on the pew heaters, um, any recommended suppliers, I understand you're not on commission from any of them, uh, but any recommended suppliers or where people might look uh, for those? Um, okay, so the two main uh, manufacturers of pew uh, heater panels, um, and these are people that manufacture them, uh, any good electrician can install them. Um, but the two main manufacturers in the um, of them is a company called BN, that's Bravo November Thermic, um, which is a UK-based manufacturer based down on the south coast somewhere, and I can't remember exactly where. Um, so yeah, BN Thermic is one. Um, and the other one is a pew heater um, that's manufactured by a Scandinavian country um, called the Norrell Heater, N-O-R-E-L. And the distributor in the UK for that one is a company called Church Electric Heating Solutions. Um, and that is a black one with a slight swan neck on top of it. Um, they have different pros and cons um, depending on how visible they are. So I would personally turn around and say the BN Thermic one is a stronger, more robust heater, uh, which is ideal if you haven't got a pew back um, because it can take a few knocks a little bit better than the other one. And the other one just happens to look a little bit more elegant and it's black. So it depends where they go. Thanks for that, Matt. There's been a few people um, who have um, asked questions about uh, the price cap and there seems to be a bit of confusion about people who are in the parish buying energy basket and whether they're eligible for the price cap. I don't know whether you can give any advice on that at all. Yeah, I don't know specifically about the um, uh, parish buying basket, um, but if um, if you procured your energy uh, since I think it's April this year, so April 2021, and you're paying over that 32 or 10, then obviously that that price cap will uh, will then apply. You can get the benefit of that, and it will bring your bills down. Um, uh, perhaps the energy basket may have procured before that time, and at rates lower than that. And obviously, if if you're benefiting from a lower rate, um, you haven't hit the cap, and therefore you won't benefit from the cap. So that that may be what's going on. Uh, but I don't know the specifics about um, parish buying, um, but certainly um, small commercial um, uh, energy rates are covered by the price cap. So um, if you are paying above those sorts of 32 and 10 um, rates in there, um, then you are eligible to get that if you procured after uh, April this year. Thanks, Matt. And one last question uh, that has come up a few times. Um, is there anything that people can do about their standing charges? <laughs> I wish. Um, <laughs> very, very, very little um, uh, in there. They have gone up massively, as well as the rates we've been talking about. Um, and different um, energy companies will have different pricing structures. Um, so some will put more cost onto their standing charges and some will put more costs onto their rates. Um, it just depends slightly on their business model um, out there. Um, some of it's got to do with how large your meter is, some of it's to do with what area of the country you're in, um, and some standing charges on electricity um, are impacted about when you're using your electricity. Um, so if you're using it um, predominantly in lower um, peak times, so um, late in the evenings, weekends, um, uh, then often you can, um, you can attract lower standing charges, but there is very little you can do about it, unfortunately. Thanks a lot, Matt. And there has just been one more come in um, from St Matt's Church. Is it better to replace gas boilers or change to electric heaters? And that'll be our that'll be our final question for this afternoon. Well, now there's an interesting question. <laughs> um, it massively depends on how much you are using your church. Um, so if your church is only used for I don't know, four or five sessions a week, maybe a couple of hours uh, in length, um, then electric heaters are almost certainly going to be uh, a better and more efficient way of providing thermal comfort. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, um, if your church is being used for six or eight hours a day, at least five days a week, then electric heaters are probably not gonna be your best choice in there. 
However, replacing your gas boiler like for like um, is now going to be something that's going to be rather difficult to do if you're certainly within the Church of England. Um, and it was a church asking that question uh, because the faculty jurisdiction rules, if you're into those, uh, changed in July this year. Um, and it means that actually you now, rather than just get on and change your um, uh, any fossil fuel boiler like for like, you could get on previously under list A, so you couldn't really need to ask for permission. Uh, you now need to go for full faculty uh, permission on that because of the uh, potential for causing environmental harm. Um, uh, the faculty jurisdiction rules also made putting under pew heaters, um, panel heaters in a list B matter and not a full faculty. So um, they very much uh, trying to make sure the faculty rules are uh, uh, supporting churches that are moving towards zero carbon. Um, in there. So um, definitely direct electric heating, I say, if you're little used church, um, probably something else. If you're a, if you're a daily used church, um, that probably isn't going to be replacing your gas boiler like for like, though, you would maybe into the heat pump territory. Fabulous. Matt, thank you ever so much for this afternoon. It's been fascinating and, and really useful. Um, so thank you ever so much um, for your time. Um, and to all of you, thank you for joining us this afternoon. I hope it's been a really useful um, uh, experience for you. Thank you for all that you are doing in your churches to serve your local communities in these most challenging times. We'll be sending out the recording and the slides. Um, if you'd like to know more about CUF and what we're doing at the moment, please do visit our website or sign up for our newsletter and, uh, and you'll be able to have a sort of um, first dibs on on coming to sessions like this as we as we seek to support churches that are engaging with, with their communities um, but thank you all very much and um, I'll leave you now to go and put into practice all of the wonderful tips that Matt's given us this afternoon so um, thank you have a good afternoon and God bless to you all